Hey, what's going on? I'm Will from DevOps for Developers, and this is part two of DevOps interview questions and answers where I tell you why that is the right answer, because I think why is incredibly important. You know, in decades past, I was a nuclear engineer for the Navy, and a large part of that training wasn't focused on how to operate the nuclear power plant, but why. And the reason for that was because if you could deduce why something was the way it was, then when things weren't that way, you could also work your way backwards to figure out what set of scenarios could be triggering that behavior, which, you know, in the case of nuclear power, kind of turned out to be a handy technique to have. So let's just jump back into it. Our next question here is can we move or copy Jenkins files from one server to another? And I just freaking love this question. If I could only ask one question of a candidate to determine whether or not I was gonna hire him as a DevOps engineer, this would probably be the question I would ask because it works on so many levels. First of all, you have to understand how Jenkins operates to answer this question. You have to know that all of your Jenkins stuff lives in a single folder on your server and you can take that folder and drop it on any other Jenkins server in the world and you've completely restored your Jenkins environment. So that gives us the opportunity to talk about things like disaster recovery. You know, what's your backup strategy? Are you backing up that folder on Jenkins? And how do you test that? Because as you know, if you aren't testing your backups, you don't really have backups. And so you can take that backup from your Jenkins server, restore it to a new Jenkins server. You should see all of your stuff there. It should work just like it does on the original Jenkins server. And so that's a great conversation to have. The other thing it allows us to do is it gives us the opportunity to talk about containers because a really common way to run Jenkins is you just fire up a, a Docker image as a container that's um, from Jenkins, you know, or from Docker Hub, that's the official Jenkins image. And then you mount your data directory into that container. And so then your upgrade process becomes something like just killing that container pulling the new image from Docker Hub and bringing it back up and you've just upgraded your Jenkins system. So now that we're doing that, we can talk about different things from a container perspective, like, you know, how do you mount that volume? What ports do you need to open? What does your Docker or your containerized network look like? You know, how do you put in load balancers? How do you expose those ports and have all kinds of different conversations that go down that. So the real answer to the question is, can we move or copy Jenkins from one server to another? Yes, you can. It's just a single folder that contains everything specific to that Jenkins installation. And then the possibilities that that question opens up are just super cool for interviewing a DevOps candidate. So our next question is, what is continuous integration? And you'll hear this a lot, CI, continuous integration. A lot of times it's merged together with CI, CD, and so what it really means is whenever an engineer creates a feature branch in their code and they open up a pull request and that pull request is reviewed and merged into master, continuous integration gives us the opportunity to hook into that process and run integration tests. Now this could be um, unit tests, that could be integration tests. We could do things like running a linter to make sure that the code follows an agreed upon code format used by the entire engineering team. But either way, we just know through the process of continuous integration that we've done all the checks that we want to do before merging that code to master so that we're confident that that code is ready to go to production. Now that's continuous integration. That doesn't mean we actually push that code to production. It's the integration of the code, not the deployment of the code, which is the CD portion of CI CD. Our next question here is what is a Jenkins pipeline? And I really like Jenkins pipelines a lot. It's a configuration file that allows you to define the different steps that happen in a particular Jenkins job. So you've got Jenkins monitoring a specific Git repo for your application, and then you can have your pipeline built out so that 
whenever a pull request is open, you run your integration tests and your linting tests. And whenever that um, pull request is merged into master, you build a Docker image and push that Docker image up to your container registry, wherever that may be. And you can even have it do the deployment for you and perform health checks so that it can monitor the status of that deployment and roll back as necessary. And so pipelines allow you to do that. They define different stages of your pipeline, and then they define the steps that are to be taken within each stage of that pipeline. And you can do that. The steps that are taken can either be done through Jenkins plugins or, you know, using the old fallback, ever reliable bash scripts where it just runs a bash script on the Jenkins server or on the Jenkins worker node that performs those steps for you. Next question, explain the prerequisites for a DevOps implementation. So I actually did a video that covers this from a different perspective. It's um, why you will fail at DevOps because the prerequisites that you need for a su successful DevOps implementation are, first of all, management buy-in. You've got to have support from the organization to reinvent these processes that you use to get code into production. If they aren't down for the change, the change is never going to happen. Um, some of the other steps here are version control. Yeah, you've got to use Git or some type of version control system to track the changes to your code. Automated tools is the next answer here. And this is where this question really starts to go downhill for me. Automated tools. Well, that's kind of vague. Um, I mean, I can automate a tool that calls Uber Eats for me every day at lunch. And technically I have automated tools, but that doesn't have anything to do with my DevOps implementation. So I think that needs to be more specific. You need automated tools that are specific to implementing the CI CD workflow of your application. Automated testing, um, no, that's not true at all. You don't need automated testing as a prerequisite to a DevOps implementation. Automated testing is part of the implementation, not a prerequisite. And in addition to that, automated testing does you absolutely zero good if there's no freaking tests. So the prerequisite here is you have to have tests for your code, A, and B, those tests actually have to be representative of how your application is used. And then the last one here is automated deployment. Um, no, no, that's not a prerequisite to a DevOps implementation either. Automated deployment is an artifact of a DevOps implementation. And it's not even a mandatory one at that. You may look at your um, application and your organization and say, you know what, we're not automating deployment due to different it could be due to you know some brittle code that still needs to be addressed. It could be due to the way your application is used. It could be due to regulatory requirements. There's a whole bunch of reasons of why you may not automate the deployment, but that doesn't mean that you don't have DevOps implemented everywhere else in your, or in your organization. And it's certainly not a prerequisite to implementing DevOps. I mean, if you've already got automated deployments, and you're talking about implementing DevOps, I got some follow-up questions for you. Next question, and these kind of get into like the theoretical questions, you know, like the questions of, um, you know, tell me about your greatest weakness and like those kinds of standard interview questions. This sort of gets off on that path. How will you approach a project to implement DevOps? I think the real answer there kind of ties back into the previous question is finding out whether or not you have management buy-in and if so, what's their definition of DevOps and what are they really looking for? How do you define success in this? The key to that really comes down to communication, which is really, really tough. Like if you're a junior engineer and you're just getting started in this industry, it's going to be really challenging for you to ask those hard questions, mainly because those questions are hard to answer. And so as a junior engineer, if you're asking senior management questions that they don't really want to sit down and focus on the answer to because they're difficult questions, it's going to be a, a difficult environment. So um, the right answer there is how do you approach that? Um, well, you have to make sure that the prerequisites are in place, understand 
what the objectives are, and then define metrics for success because your definition of success has to align with the management's definition of success or there will be no success, period. Um, Key to that is something I've talked about in multiple videos on this channel about communication and using Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, to ask people questions in a way that gets them to elaborate and give you more information than what they initially did. And in doing so, you discover the meaning behind what they're trying to say, because that's like that's like the goal of software engineering, right? I've always said that the goal of version 1.0 of every application is to determine what the customer meant to ask for the first time. And it's the same thing with implementing DevOps. You know, you'll implement DevOps and your first iteration of a DevOps implementation is successful if it reveals what you really should have implemented the first time. So our next question is, what are your expectations from a career perspective in DevOps? This one, there's not really a right answer to, well, there is, it's a, it's an answer that's right for you, which is very personal, right? What do you want to get out of this career? And the reason that that's important is because it's got to align with the job that you're taking, because if it doesn't, you're not going to be satisfied in that job. And if you're not satisfied, you're not going to stay there long term, right? So it's important for you to sit down and think about and articulate, why am I doing DevOps? I've actually got a video on why I do DevOps. So check that out if you're looking for some things to spark your own internal monologue, but um, define what's important to you and why you're going down this path. All right, our next question is define the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And it's really kind of a subtle line. If we just break it down to its fundamental definitions, continuous delivery is getting the code where it's ready to be delivered to production. Like you're ready to deploy to production. All you got to do is hit the deploy button. Continuous deployment is where that button is hit automatically. Now, the reason that question is important is like I was mentioning just a few minutes ago, for some organizations, it just doesn't make sense to implement continuous deployment. And so you have to um, just approach that and decide on a case by case business, whether that's something that you want to do, but that's not a precursor or um, a prerequisite to implementing DevOps. You can do everything else except clicking the deploy button automatically, and that's totally acceptable. Our next question is, what is your desired salary for this job? I'm actually glad you're watching this video right now because I am gonna change the way you negotiate for your salary right now. Here's the deal when it comes to desired salary, you know, because a lot of jobs they don't offer or reveal what the salary range is. And so they're going to ask you, well, what would you like to make in this job? Here's the golden rule of negotiation. Whoever throws out the first number loses. So whenever this question comes up, I want you to say this. I'm sure that whatever salary you offer me is going to be a generous salary that's in line with other positions across the industry and stop talking right there. Don't say another damn word, all right? So you've got to sit back and just be comfortable in the silence here. When you say that, you just sit back and you wait. You don't have to like lock eyes with them. It's not a staring contest. You know, you can look at your resume, look at whatever they may have given you to review, whatever, but you're not going to say another word because whoever speaks next loses. And they may ask you this question or rephrase it a couple of times. You stick with that answer every time. I'm sure you're going to make a generous offer to me that is in line with other salaries for this type of position across the industry. And just leave it at that. Doing so is to your benefit, because let's say that you're just getting started in this industry, you know, and in the past you have been at a job where you made $30,000 a year, but DevOps engineers, you know, make 80,000, 100,000, 120,000, 150,000, like significantly more than what you've been making in the past. And so you're going to feel uncomfortable knowing that your current salary is 30,000 a year. You're going to feel awkward asking for $130,000 a year. So if you get cold feet and say, I'll do it for $50,000 a year, but they had $150,000 a year budgeted, 
you just saved them $100,000 a year and you also just left $100,000 on a table. So don't get in that position. Don't throw out the first number. Just tell them that you will accept or that you are expecting an offer that is in line with other salaries for that position throughout the industry. And our final question for this video, look at this piece of code and determine the output from it. You see this a lot in software engineering jobs, but it's also relevant for DevOps engineers. And I've talked in multiple videos about how important it is for you to understand a programming language. And that's the whole goal of this because you're going to be in an outage at some point and the outage is going to be caused by some funky code that you're trying to figure out how it works. So if you don't have really, really strong programming skills or if you don't have any knowledge of the language that the question is in, you know, if, if you're familiar with Python or showing you a JavaScript example, you're going to be a little bit confused. So don't hesitate to ask questions here. That's really, really important. And that's one of the things I look for whenever I do this is someone to look at something and say, I'm not sure what this is doing. Can you help me through that? Or what is this supposed to be doing? And if you can like approach it and say, well, we've got this doing this and then this stage is doing this, but this section right here, I don't really know what that's doing. And that's sort of, you know, predicates the output right here. That's all I'm looking for is for you to be able to work your way through to the parts that you stumble on. And then when you hit that stumbling block, call in for help from someone who can help you out. So that's it. Um, that's two videos of DevOps interviews, questions and answers and the whys behind the question. So I hope that was helpful for you. If it was or if it wasn't, leave me some comments down below and I'll see y'all in the next video.